Well, we continue on in this series, Jesus, Lord of All, kind of walking you through the book of Colossians. And as we do, we are looking at the supremacy of Christ over all in our lives, that he is ultimate in his lordship, not just over our lives, but all of creation. And it's been in this series that we have wanted to firmly establish that his teachings, his word, his spirit is to have a place of preeminence in our lives. If you remember in the first week I talked about the fact that we need to have Christ not just be predominant in our lives. I would suggest that if you're a follower of Christ, if you've been in this church for any length of time, if you would call yourself a Christian, then you would say that Christ is predominant, his word is predominant in your life, that is, he's probably in the top 10. Some of you might even say he's in the top five, that God is predominant, Jesus is predominant, church is predominant, faith is predominant, the Bible, predominant. But I would suggest to you today that if you are going to experience the fullness of what Christ intended for all of us, that Christ cannot be just predominant, but that Christ has to have preeminence in our lives. Not just that Christ is important in my life, but that Christ is most important. That without Christ, without his supremacy, without his lordship and the authority of his scriptures governing and guiding my life, that I'm missing out. And in looking at Colossians as we do it, any of the uh, Pauline epistles as they call them, Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, Colossians, all of those New Testament books, really they are in fact letters. Letters that Paul the Apostle and others of the Apostles were writing to various churches in the area. Paul himself traveling through uh, Italy and Spain and Greece and Turkey and various uh, areas around the <clears throat> Middle East area. Churches had formed, if you would, out of the apostles' teaching, the apostles having walked with Christ. They then formed these churches. They would gather together, break bread. They would tell the stories of Jesus. Years later on, then what would happen was is there would be other churches and say, well, I did not walk with Jesus. I walked with the person who walked with Jesus, and he told me stories about Jesus, and we would gather together and tell those stories, and then other churches would form, and time would pass on, and then it would be, I didn't know Jesus, but I knew, didn't know Jesus' friend, but I was somebody who walked with Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who walked with Jesus' friend. And it would just continue to spin larger and larger and larger, and they didn't have print. So the stories could get a little bit uh, skewed, if you would. What was happening was is that everybody was interpreting the words of Christ, interpreting what Jesus really meant to say based on their own conjecture, their own opinions, their own, their own measure of righteousness, if you would. And everybody was kind of interpreting, saying, well, this is what Jesus really meant. Sound familiar? And because everybody had their own idea of what Jesus was actually saying or creating, they ended up laying down certain laws or rules or regulations by which they would understand the theology of which Christ had been teaching. And so the laws of God, his will, his way, and his decree for you and I ended up being slightly twisted and warped and distorted in order to bind or control or to manipulate those against the very instructions that God had given to the people in the first place to provide safety and protection over their lives. I've come to realize over the years that I have been a pastor that not everybody agrees on what the Bible has to say. There are times when people will come to me, I'm right now going to be teaching you for the next 35 minutes, not everybody of you is going to agree. Some of you are going to sit there and you're going to go, well, that's what you say, pastor, but I think differently. I understand that. I've learned to have to deal with it at any rate. I have people that will come into my office and come in and they'll sit down and they'll talk with me about, about what they think God wants for their lives. And sometimes I find myself saying, are you asking or are you telling? Have you already decided? Do you already know what God's uh, telling you what to do? And if that's the case, then why are you wasting my time? Or rather, are you asking questions? And do you have any intentions of receiving what we believe to be what God is trying to say? Wouldn't it be better if everybody would just think the way you thought? 
Have you ever said that to yourself? If everybody just read the Bible the way I read the Bible, if everybody understood Jesus the way I understand Jesus, if everybody would just follow along their Christian faith the way I do, the world would be a much better place. I was looking this week at some of the laws that are existing uh, still on our books today that perhaps in some respects would be considered to be outdated and yet they are still valid to this day. And I thought they would be a great way to launch off. Do you know that in southern, most of our uh, southern Ontario, uh, most in southwestern Ontario towns, there is still a law in the books that makes it illegal to spit. There are still anti-spit laws. Uh, I found another one here. If you ever happen upon an injured migratory bird in a Canadian national park, do you know that you're required to kill it immediately? If not, you're fined $300. I also found out this one law. There's a law in Edmonton that says that your horses are not allowed to stand on the streets for much longer than 20 minutes. It was a law that was attempted to stop chit-chat with merchants. In Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, do you know that all cyclists are required to carry kerosene lanterns that are plain to see in sight while they're riding their bikes? Now think about today where we have all of the, the helmet laws, where if you don't wear a helmet, it's like 50 or $75. Think about the fact that in Glace Bay, you're supposed to ride your bike carrying a lit kerosene lantern while you're riding. Do you know that it is still written in Canada's criminal code that states that anyone in a public place that creates a bad smell is considered having committed a felony of up to two years imprisonment? <laughs> you know, I wonder if that's where we got all of our anti-perfume environment things that we have these days. And in Toronto, it's still illegal for you to allow your pigs to run loose in the streets. If you have a pig, you have to keep it on a leash. Now here's the last one that I found rather unique, and you just kind of just kind of picture this. That in the Yukon territories, in the Northwest Territories, it is still illegal to this day for you to operate a motor vehicle with an uncaged grizzly bear inside. <laughs> of course, you know that begs a question because we only create laws because we deem them necessary. So that means that in order to have a law like that in the books, there was some idiot at some point who decided that it was okay to have an uncaged grizzly bear in their vehicle. Or there were plenty of idiots to warrant having to actually make a law against it. And I was like, hey, so the point is that in some times, in some cultures, during some seasons, if you would, there are laws that at one point are deemed necessary to create, and yet somehow over time, education, learning over years, what once troubled society no longer troubles society today. That in one time, something is deemed important, and now it is no longer deemed important or necessary. So what changed? Do the laws actually still need to be upheld, even though they seem redundant or no longer are necessary? I mean, we laugh and groan about some of these out-of-date laws because many of them seem absurd or, or, or ridiculous. But if you were to look into most church cultures, if you were to ask most church denominations, you would find that there are whole kinds of laws and rules and regulations that while they may not be on paper, they nevertheless exist. Some of them are very funny. Some of them are quite sad, aren't they? How many of you grew up in the church? I mean, young kid, the whole nine yards. Okay, I'm going to take you through a walk through memory lane for some of you. If you did not grow up in the church, get ready to be amazed. When I was a kid growing up, I would get a spanking if I got caught riding my bike on a Sunday. 
Bikes were only allowed to be ridden Monday to Saturday. I could never ride a bike on Sunday. And for all of you who are just dreaming of these warming days that will come when you will find yourself at Grand Bend, you'll actually start coming to the 9.30 as opposed to the 11.30 so you can get your car down to Grand Bend to park your horse, I mean, your park your car down in Grand Bend before anyone else. Uh, you... Uh, would never ever be allowed to go swimming when I was a kid growing up in church. I remember that we could go to a restaurant and eat on Sunday, but we could not go shopping for anything that we could not buy Monday to Saturday. How many remember that? And I always couldn't figure that out, that the restaurants were holy ground, I guess, but the grocery store or the mall, you, could buy, you couldn't buy shoes on Sunday, but you could surely buy Chinese food. I don't understand, but that was the rule. I remember growing up and divorced people were not welcomed in the church. They could not have any ministry. They could not usher. They could not greet. They couldn't do a thing. They weren't welcome to attend. I remember women were not allowed to wear earrings that dangled below the earlobe and have ministry on our platform. That means you would have been off. You would not have made it. Do you realize, Bonnie, that you would be considered a very loose woman because you have dangling <laughs> earrings? A very loose and immoral woman. Wow, I don't think Dennis would agree with me on that one. Uh, and I, I thought about that today because, I mean, with Justin and those big pipes with tattoos all over them and thought, Oh my goodness, that, that, was, that was reserved for the, for the, for the, there he is, yeah, covering, the, and you didn't want to be self-conscious. <laughs> Those pipes and a short sleeve t-shirt, but you don't want to be self-conscious. Oh my goodness, Justin. Where in the world is happening to the church? Tattoos, long earrings. And I remember the dresses. In 1985, when Cheryl and I went to Bible college, there was the dean of women who would run around with a ruler, tape measure, a ruler, and she would run around like this, and she was measuring the skirts on girls, and if they were more than six inches above the knee, they had to be gone and thrown out. Do you know your young, uh, young Timmy Schwent, who's at Kamoka right now, to, can't even defend himself, for the first 12 weeks that he attended Eastern, Back in 1985, not 55, back in 1985, men had this thing called a mullet. <laughs> Timmy, young Timmy had a mullet that went right down past his shoulders, and for the first eight to 12 weeks, Tim tucked his mullet underneath his shirt collar, then did it up and put his tie on, and had his mullet tucked right down, and he got away with it until rumors had gotten out, and somebody walked over and ripped it out the back of his head, and shh. I remember as a youth pastor almost being fired from my first church because on a Sunday morning, I dared come off the platform behind the holy pulpit and stood beside the communion table and I leaned on it. And because I put my elbow on the communion table and rested my hip on the edge of the communion table, I was called into a board meeting, told that if I ever did it again, you'd be gone. That same church told Cheryl and I as youth pastors that we were forbidden to have a baby shower for anyone who got pregnant out of marriage, in particularly teenage girls. We broke that law anyways and had the shower in our home. <laughs> Are church laws created and interpreted and applied in light of the culture? Or do they transfer, transform time and culture? Do, do the rules change? Do we, we create them with good intentions or do we create them with manipulative ideals? Do, do the rules ever become redundant or unnecessary? Can they be right at some point in time and then all of a sudden they suddenly become wrong? Do we come to a greater sense of enlightenment? Is that what it is? Or do we somehow lower the standard and compromise ourselves? And that's why some rules that applied yesterday no longer apply today. Are all laws subject to time and relevance? And what about God? Does God change his mind? Has God changed? Has God gotten soft? 
depending on the interpretation of the church in which it delves out the rules and the regulations of Christianity, his statutes and precepts, are they all just cultural? Well, that was then, but this is now. Many of the religious rules that churches keep today are, while they're not written down, many of us attempt to keep them, or at least we expect others to keep them, even if we ourselves are soft on them for our own lives. Legalism can be defined as a strict adherence to the law, specifically as to faith. A legalist is one who believes that our performance in keeping these rules is a way to, way to get favor from God. That if I keep the rules, God is happy with me. If I break the rules, then God is unhappy with me. And so the, the role of the church is to enforce the rules and thereby please God by our actions. Legalism is a human attempt to gain salvation or to prove our spirituality by getting everyone to conform to a list of do's and don'ts. Before we jump into our text this morning, before we make too many judgments about legalism and whether it applies to your life or not, let, let's just make some, a few observations. First of all, legalism is measured in my own perspective. We are all legalists in one way, shape, or another because we all have our ideas as to what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is proper, what Jesus is trying to tell us to do. In essence, we really think that our sin smells better than anybody else's sin. And we have little tolerance for people who sin differently than we sin. Our sin is okay because, well, God said it's okay. But everyone else's sin, now that's not acceptable. Legalism is also very contagious. That's why Jesus reserved some of his hardest criticisms for legalistic list makers. He said, they, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain because their rules are taught from men. Legalism, legalism is also a life killer, not a life giver. Nothing will destroy your joy, your enthusiasm. Nothing will make you want to not serve God. Nothing will drain the life out of you than trying to uphold your Christian faith by observance of a set of rules and regulations. It produces large quantities of self-righteousness and judgment and condemnation. If you are succumbing to legalism, you will find that it produces all kinds of guilt in your life. It makes us narrow-minded and divisive, asking everyone to list to a set of standards that, that they have adopted while well by thinking that your list of standards are better than other standards. That's why we have so many denominations today, because everyone can't agree on what Jesus actually said. And we think we're more holy than the church down the road. Legalism makes it absolutely impossible for people to see Jesus. If you're a guest with us today and faith or is something brand new to you and you're even considering it today, I, I pray that you will take these words and you will hold them very softly and tenderly. I hope that you don't experience anything of what I'm speaking of today here in this place. That's not my heart and my passion, that you would not feel any measure or spirit of legalism because nothing will make anybody turn their back on Christ if they see him as a drill sergeant. The last observation would be is that most of us fall into legalism at some point in our lives even though we try not to. Because most legalism starts off with good intentions. We start off by trying to control an environment or controlling an individual because we care about them. Parents, we set up rules and regulations not because we're trying to wreck your life, but because we're trying to better your life. We're trying to keep you safe. We're trying to keep you from harm. How do we express it? Because some of you are sitting here saying, whoa, whew. I can go to my happy place now because that's, he's got to be talking about you. He's certainly not talking about me. How do we do this? Well, we do it by judging other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our best intentions. We look, we look at everybody else's lives and we see what they're doing and we make up our mind that they are sinners because of their actions, but we excuse ourselves because we understand the intentions of our heart. We apply standards that are easy for us but difficult for others. We, we rationalize our faults as a result of our childhood as not being all that bad. Well, you see, I understand that I've got these things in my life, but you know what? I wasn't breastfed as a child. You know what? My daddy, he wasn't very nice to me, so you know what? I'm allowed to be like this. You don't understand my past. You don't understand my background. I'm okay to be like this, pastor. Well, they're not. But you see, it was in my childhood, so I'm excused to be like this. Some of us blank our faults out altogether. Some of us hide our faults from others, but we project them onto others. 
And so if we struggle with lust, all we see is lustful people. If we, if we struggle with lying, we see nothing but deceitful people. Ministers are most famous for this. My dad taught me a long time ago, just keep your eyes open and your ears open. Whatever you hear the minister talking about all the time, chances are that's his problem. We invite certain trapdoor standards that need to be met, and if we don't, there is a trapdoor that opens right up and the person drops straight into hell. It might be the doctrine of the Trinity or predestination or, or tithing or speaking in tongues or, or homosexuality or some kind of sin that in our eyes, because we don't struggle with that sin, if anybody else struggles with that sin, the moment that they commit that sin, boom, straight to hell. But us, oh, no, 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 no. You don't understand. We're, we're working it through. God's being patient with me. And we compensate for our faults with things like, well, you know what, I know I have a bad temper and I use my tongue to kill people, as Jesus said, but I really like animals. Like, I'm, I want to save the whale. I know my tongue is killing people, but, oh, man, we've got to take care of creation. Colossians 2 says, Therefore, don't let anybody judge you by what you're eating or drinking or, or regard to religious festivals or celebrations or even the Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality is found in Christ. These things are shadows of that which is to come, which is the person of Jesus Christ. The characteristics of shadows are such that it, a shadow is a darkness. It's not the real thing. The real thing is the light. A shadow has no substance. The real thing has the, all of the substance. A shadow is shifting, it's temporary, it's fleeting, it moves around, it darts along the ground, but, but the real thing is the thing behind that as it reflects the light. And the danger is, is that if we get caught into this too much, we can be deceived, we can be consequently disqualified from true faith in Christ by something as sketchy as a shadow. The reality is found in Christ, and you've got to catch this now. If you don't catch anything else I say, there is a powerful truth here that all of our opinions about personal choices and activities and practices and right or wrong and what the Bible says, what the Bible doesn't say, the amount of liberty that we have regarding those things of what we can do and what we can't do and our accountability to those who hold us accountable and to those who we hold accountable to us. These things are all just shadows. They're not the real thing. Those who rely on legalism are not enjoying the essence of the Christian life, for they do not have the true substance, Paul is saying to the Colossians. The one thing that we have that is the same for all of us is not the rules and regulations that we have in this church or any other church for that matter. The one thing that we have in common is Jesus Christ and him crucified and the supremacy of Christ and his love over all of our lives so that in him and pursuing him and loving him with all of our hearts, with all of our choices and our activities and our practices, that is what's truly real. So what are we supposed to do? How do we respond? to those who either imposing legalism or to those temptations that we have to try to get someone to conform to ours. Do we ignore it? I see that a lot. You know what? Frankly, this whole discussion, I really don't care what you think, Pastor. I don't care what the church says. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and you can do whatever you want to do, and frankly, it's none of your business what I say or do or how I live. I'll love Jesus my way. You live Jesus your way. Not and be part of the body of Christ. Not and be part of a spiritual community. You're not afforded that right. We can respond by pleasing everybody. Well, you know what? I can't do anything that would be deemed worldly. And so if anybody has anything or says anything that would be considered worldly, then I've got to stop that. I can't do anything. And so we live our lives on eggs. We live our lives on pins and needles because we don't want to do anything that would appear worldly. Or we pacify. That is, we, we do what appears to be righteous in public, but behind closed doors. <laughs> whatever I do in my home is my own business. Just It's whatever appears on the outside. Or we can be a big rule breaker and a, and a rebuker and we can speak out on anybody who imposes judgment and we can just start fights everywhere we go and, and arguments. Or I don't know, how about we try love? How about we just run after Christ? 
and allow his love and his voice and his rule and his authority. Mom and dad, I'm not saying that you don't have rules in your home. I'm not saying that you don't speak to your children about the things that you prefer and not prefer. I'm not asking you to lay down those things. But I am saying this. You need to trust your parenting in the early years with your children and then rest them into the hands of Christ who loved them and died on the cross for them because let me remind you, you didn't. Jesus died for them. And Jesus wants to redeem them and he wants to show them. And if they've done any kind of a job to help them to hear the voice of God, let Jesus take care of them. His voice is bigger and stronger, and his Holy Spirit is far more able to convict us of righteousness and unrighteousness. Can someone say amen to that? And by the way, if it's good for parenting, it's good for friends too. I'm not saying that we don't hold one another accountable. I'm not saying that we don't have those who have an authority in our lives. I'm not saying you don't listen to your pastor and you don't, and that there aren't times for tough love. The Bible's also very clear. The Lord chastises those whom he loves. And there's time for rebuke. And there is time for chastisement. Just got to make sure that we do it in the right way. And we got to do it with the right voice. Let me read for you our text today very quickly. Don't let anybody criticize you about what you eat or drink. We already said this. For not celebrating Jewish holidays or Sabbaths. For these are only temporary rules that ended when Christ came. They were only shadows of the real thing of Christ himself. Don't let anybody declare you as lost when you refuse to worship angels as they say you must do. These people say they've seen a vision. They, 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 they think they know that how you should live. These proud men, though they claim to be humble, they're not. They have very clever imaginations, but they're not connected to Christ. The head, which all of us who are his body are joined together. For we're joined together by strong sinew. We are joined together by Christ. And we get our nourishment and our strength from God. And since you died, as it were, with Christ. And, and this has set you free from following the world's ideas of what it means to be saved. By, by doing good and by obeying, being, obeying various rules. Why do you keep on following them anyways? Why are you still bound by rules as not eating or not tasting or even touching certain food? Such rules are mere human teachings. Food was made to be eaten and used. These rules may seem good for rules of this kind require strong devotion and are, and are humiliating and hard on the body, but they have no effect when it comes to conquering a person's evil thoughts and desires. They, they just make everybody proud. In those days, food and ceremonies, they were considered as big as it gets in terms of honoring God and pleasing him in righteousness. And so the observance of those things were, were considered ultimate in their time. For our times, we have other things that we consider to be far more important to follow. But everyone had their own set of rules and they were different from everyone else. And so we had legalism, which we've already talked about, which is faith with a complete dependence on personal works, following the rules and the regulations as a means of securing salvation. But on the other hand, what do we have today? There was a time when that was very, very big, especially in my childhood growing up, and many of yours, as you've already indicated. But now we've thrown it all out. Now, without ever considering the reason or the spirit behind them, now we live with license. Now there seems to be faith with an absence of work or any kind of personal responsibility, living free from all the rules or regulations, whether they be biblical or man-made, because Jesus gave us the new covenant, and in the new covenant, we're free to do whatever we like, with no consequences, no restriction. Someone has said that license is the abuse of grace to serve oneself selfishly and sinfully. It's unrestrained life that scorns at God's commands. The Christian life who falls in a license may reason that they can indulge in any kind of sin they want because, well, they're eternally saved and so their salvation cannot be lost. Or that, you know what, because God has already forgiven me, what's the big deal? That, you know what, I know that I probably shouldn't do this, but God will forgive me. Forgives you too. It's not that big a deal. I believe that there's always a principle that underlies the rule of why it is given in the first place. And that we would do, he, do well to heed and even to reinterpret the rule or the principles behind some of the rules that were of yesterday. 
Because the danger, of course, is that we may miss out on true holiness and righteousness because we're making up our own version of what it means to be truly free in Christ. And we may be missing out on certain things that God wanted us to remember. Let me give you one example. When I was a teenager, um, I was taught, and it was very, very, very common, that if you went into the movie, movie theater, the movie house, that that was the place where the devil lived. And that if a Christian were to go into a movie theater, the moment that they stepped into the door, they didn't even get to the ticket window. The moment they stepped into the door, there was that trap door. It opened up, and when there was a shoot, went straight to hell. And it was really, really fast because the flames would come all up and everything. But, but you went straight to hell as soon as you stepped into a movie theater. I remember at 17 years of age going to my very first movie. And I was so scared because I didn't want to get caught by, the, by anybody from the church or the pastor. And the town was only about 5,000 people. That I drove from Meaford to Owen Sound to go to the, Meaver, to, to, to go to the theater because there was like 23, 24,000 people. So I was a big city. And so no one was going to catch me there. And I remember going to the movie theater and thinking to myself, oh, feeling so convicted as I watched this film. And it was so good, but I'm feeling so bad because I knew it was so wrong and that God was going to hate me and I was probably going to go to hell. Do you know what I went to see? Walt Disney's Fox and the Hound. <laughs> I love going to the theater. I, I, I can tell you, I'm glad that we've changed some of the rules because I love going to the theater. I think I love going to the theater more for the popcorn than, than sometimes for the movies. But you see, then we got the VHS. Uh, for you know, those young people, DVDs, only in a box form. <laughs> and instead of having going to the theater, we brought the theater in these little boxes. We brought them into our home so that all we had to do was go down to the, to the, to the VHS store and we would actually rent them. And as long as we kind of keep our thumb on the rated R so that nobody else could see what it was, or we'd get a couple of Disney ones and we'd stack it on top of the bad ones and we'd just kind of get it away and hopefully they would just scan them. And but Then we could watch whatever we want in the privacy of our own home and no one would ever know except our kids. And then we got this thing called the internet. And now there's nothing you can't see. Now you can watch anything about everything. And you don't even have to watch it on your television. You can keep it really, really private, and you can watch it all by yourself right on this little phone here. What we missed out was the principle behind all of the rules in the first place. The principle was this. It was in a little song that was taught to me as a young child. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above, he's looking down in judgment, <laughs> condemnation, guilt, in hellfire and brimstone. No. How did it go? For the Father up above, he's looking down in. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Because he's looking down in love and he wants the best for me and he's trying to protect me. We forgot the principle behind the law in the first place. You see, we need to remember that right is right. It'll always be right, and wrong is wrong, and it will always be wrong. The truth does not morph or evolve. God's word stands as true today as it did for my grandparents, and hopefully it will stand for my grandchildren one day. But liberty suggests that we understand the principles and the purposes behind God's decrees and that we need to reapply them as culture changes around us. We strive to honor Christ with our lives and our actions and our attitudes in a way that brings glory and worship to God of all creation, in a way that our faith is demonstrated in what we say and what we do. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called liberty. Faith demonstrated by our works. Being saved and redeemed and set free by God's grace through faith in Christ rather than by keeping the laws, being transformed by his grace and power continually, fulfilling his commands and loving him with all of our hearts. And so we need to remind ourselves of the position that we stand in. In order for us to do this, we remember our legal standing. When you surrender your life to Christ, you find yourself complete in him. You no longer stand trying to keep the law by yourself, which you cannot do by yourself, but now you are complete in Christ, having been justified by faith in him. And that we are alive to him and dead to ourselves and dead to our sins that sin no longer has rule and reign over our lives, that our sins have been canceled out, not by what we do or how we perform or how we keep the rules up, but our sins are canceled because of what Christ has done on the cross, and because of that, we have the victory. 
that Jesus forgives us of all of our sins, not just the ones that we're having a hard time forgiving ourselves for. And that evil no longer has any power or authority over our lives because Christ has stripped Satan of that authority over our lives. That the only power that Satan has is what we give to him because we are afraid. And when fear governs our lives, we fall prey to the lure of legalism to going back to practicing keeping of the law because then we find ourselves some kind of internal measure of peace. And so we must refuse to be judged by the externals, thinking that somehow we know the condition of somebody's heart. God forgive us that when we point fingers at somebody and we think we know what they're going through. And and we think, you know what? You know what? God's working with me. I'm still, God is still working this out in my life and I'm still struggling with this thing, but it might be weeks or months or years and yet we look at somebody else and we think they should be cleaned up right away. God forgive us when we don't allow the same grace and mercy to mature and to grow and to learn and to allow sometimes for months, even years, as God works on an individual. I am so gracious, uh, grateful to God that he allowed me the years of failure, years of screwing up, and that the trap door didn't open up and swallow me into hell. I am so grateful that the grace of God allows me to continue to grow into maturity, into the fullness of Christ, which he longs for my life. We have to reject those in false authority, anybody who sets us up to condemn us by rules and regulations that are somehow created by someone else's ideals of what is good or bad or right or wrong. I'm not saying, as I said, again, I'm not saying that there isn't chastisement. I'm not saying that there isn't room for rebuke. I'm not saying that there aren't those who are in authority in our lives whom have been given to us by God to bring about correction, instruction, reproof, and righteousness as the word of God is rightly applied to our lives, but it's only to bring about safety, protection, freedom, blessing, not guilt, condemnation, and destruction. And to renounce all of those rules, to remember that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, to live in the freedom of Christ, And to understand that in his supremacy, in his preeminence, you don't have to live in the minuscule micro chasm of laws and rules and broke this and didn't break that and God's happy with me today and God's mad with me today and God's good about this but he's not good about that. And No, 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 no. You can live in, in something that transcends in a far greater way something that pleases him. So what's your Christianity like? Are you focused on yourself or on Christ? Are you focused on everybody else's shortcomings or the areas that you need to work on? Is your faith anchored in your own personal experiences or is it based in the word of God? A bishop once uh, said to Louis XI of France, He said, King, I want you to make an iron cage for all of those who do not think as we do concerning God and faith. King, you need to build an iron cage in which the captive can neither lie down nor stand up. The king agreed with the bishop and he had it constructed. A short time later, the bishop somehow offended King Louis. And for 14 years, the bishop was locked in the same cage, not able to stand up or to lie down, eventually driving him mad. We need to be careful of the cages that we construct, folks, because people don't think the same way we think they should, because they don't fall in line or toe the line the way we think they should. Be careful of the cages that you create, because the cage of your own design may be the cage of your own judgmental imprisonment, and it may one day drive you mad. Christianity is not a matter of what you do or what you don't do. Christianity is what's already done for you in the preeminent person of Jesus Christ. And when you understand that, then it leads to our responding in holiness and righteousness and in faith-filled actions of love and generosity, integrity and humility, the supremacy of Christ. Jesus, Lord of all. In the New Testament, 
The apostles wrote doxologies. They were not just the ends of letters, but because they did not have Holy Scripture for the common person, they were ways of creating the theological undergirding and framework by which people would memorize and have that as a, as a way to lead and guide them in the week to come when they would leave on a Sunday. And so I would have you join with us today as we read together out loud another one of Paul's doxologies. Would you read it with me? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's not what we do. It's not the rules that you keep. It's him who is at work in you who is able to do immeasurably more than keeping a bunch of rules will ever produce in your life. That is how you walk and live in true freedom and liberty. And that's how you live a life that is honoring and pleasing to Christ our Savior. As you leave here today, we have a series of questions that uh, I wanted you to be able to kind of walk through yourself as you leave here today. And I pray that they will be fodder for more discussion and more prayer all the week through. God bless you, and may you walk in liberty today.